This is Randy Shell, and I'm making a podcast entitled Hepatic Physiology and Anesthesia. It's part of the University of Kentucky Department of Anesthesiology didactic series. Let's look at the ABAIT keywords over the last 10 years or so on this topic of liver physiology, and you can see that hepatic blood flow and the factors that affect it, uh, what happens during starvation to hepatic function, how we measure hepatic dysfunction, specifically things like albumin and prothrombin time, which help give us an idea of hepatic synthetic capacity, bilirubin and its excretion, cirrhosis, its effects on neuromuscular blocking agents, hepatopulmonary syndrome, postoperative jaundice, and damage to the liver, how we measure that. So let's start right in on liver anatomy. The liver is huge. It's 2% of our body weight, approximately uh, 1,500 grams, and receives about a quarter of the whole cardiac output. The liver itself contains a lot of blood, about a liter, and that's quite evident when you do a liver surgery. And as you know, we prepare patients well for uh, potential blood loss when we know that the surgeons are working on the liver. The blood supply to the liver comes via the portal vein, which is shown down here at the bottom left with a little star next to it. Portal vein brings in blood from the GI tract and lots of nutrients into the liver. And blood supply to liver also comes from the hepatic artery, which comes off the aorta, specifically off the uh, celiac trunk here. The blood supply mainly comes from the portal vein, the volume of blood coming uh, to the liver, about 75% of it, while well, about a quarter of it comes from the hepatic artery. But if you look at the amount of oxygen that gets to the liver, about half of it comes from the portal vein, and about half of it comes from the hepatic artery. Now the liver has multiple functions. One, it stores blood. It's huge. It has about a liter of blood sitting in it. It has fat-soluble vitamins. It uh, stores excess iron. It also has filtering and cleansing uh, properties. Uh, the Kupfer cells, which are part of the reticular endothelial system, can filter out bacteria. And the one that we often focus on is the metabolism of nutrients. Glucose, the liver stores uh, glucose as glycogen and during starvation states can take that glycogen and break it down to glucose. It can synthesize fats from protein and carbohydrates and during again starvation states can metabolize fats. All plasma proteins uh, are made by the liver with the exception being gamma globulins which come from plasma cells. Albumin is the one that we normally focus on and the liver can make up to 15 to 50 grams per day of a protein. Remember that albumin is the major determinant of our plasma oncotic pressure. It has a half-life of about a couple weeks and when you're looking at preoperative labs and the albumin is less than two and a half, we say, wow, this patient's really malnourished. They could also have chronic liver disease. They're just not making albumin. Amino acids in the body are deaminated by the liver, ammonia being the product, and when you have a liver that's not functioning well, ammonia can build up and uh, result in cerebral dysfunction. The liver synthesizes coagulation factors, and most of them, with the exception being factor 3 or tissue thromboplastin, factor 4 calcium, and the one that we normally think of not being made by the liver is factor 8 von Willebrand. The factors 2, 7, 9, and 10 are the ones that are vitamin K dependent. The liver also secretes bile up to a half a liter per day can be produced. Uh, it solubilizes fats as it goes down our bile duct into our intestine and is exposed to the fats, allows us to reabsorb some of those fats. And if cholestasis occurs without bile secretion, you may not absorb the things that we need to the fats and vitamin K deficiency can occur and coagulation issues result. The bile salts go from the liver down the bile duct into the gut and then back through the portal vein to the liver and this is termed the enterohepatic or enterohepatic circulation. Bilirubin can come from hemoglobin metabolism. Uh, for example, hemolysis of hemoglobin that uh, comes from transfused blood. If their hemolysis occurs in release of bilirubin, that indirect or unconjugated uh, bilirubin can be taken up by the liver 
and conjugated in the hepatocytes primarily by adding a glucuronide molecule or sugar molecule to it, making it into direct bilirubin and actively excreting it into the bile caniculi. Again, the blood supply to the liver, focusing a little bit more in on that. Remember that the portal vein supplies most of the blood, 75%, while the hepatic artery supplies 25%, but the oxygen is uh, equally supplied by both the portal vein and the hepatic artery. The portal vein itself is not autoregulated. It receives blood from the entire digestive tract. Um, and when portal hypertension occurs, for example, with cirrhosis, the pressure can build up in that venous system and there's numerous tributaries and rudimentary connections that form these large portal systemic shunts that can allow blood to return to the systemic circulation without passing through the liver. And an example of that is esophageal varices. The hepatic artery uh, comes from the aorta, celiac trunk, uh, and then the uh, common hepatic artery. It is auto-regulated, that means that as metabolic demand goes up, blood flow goes up. As metabolic demand goes down, blood flow goes down. Compare that to the portal vein, which was not auto-regulated. Sympathetic stimulation can result in vasoconstriction of the hepatic artery, which decreases blood flow to the liver. And beta blockers, um, uh, interestingly, decrease blood flow. And you probably have had patients in the past who have cirrhosis who are on beta blockers. Uh, in an attempt to reduce portal pressures. The hepatic arterial buffer system is an important system for maintaining uh, blood flow to the liver. It is a reciprocal relationship that exists between portal venous and hepatic arterial flow when you're not in a fasting state, that is when you're eating and uh, taking in nutrients. And this relationship states basically that if portal vein flow goes up, hepatic arterial flow goes down, and conversely. You can imagine if both went up at the same time, how engorged your liver could be with blood. So this reciprocal relationship termed the hepatic arterial buffer system is present. And it is regulation of blood flow occurring almost exclusively by regulating the hepatic arterial tone. Vasoconstricting or vasodilating adenosine seems to be part of that uh, uh, hepatic arterial buffer system uh, regulation of the hepatic arterial tone. Interestingly, during a fasted state, which I guess you would be in prior to most operations, hepatic blood flow auto regulation is not very active. The impact of this on perioperative liver dysfunction is unknown. Some factors affecting hepatic blood flow one are anesthetics. Regional anesthesia spinal epidural, if you don't let the patient get uh, very hypotensive with low cardiac output, spinal epidural have little effect on hepatic blood flow. General anesthesia uniformly decreases blood flow a little bit, maybe 20 to 30 percent. And there's some physiologic and pharmacologic factors that also decrease uh, blood flow. Hypoxemia, for example, if you hyperventilate a patient and they become hypercarbic, it decreases hepatic arterial blood flow. Severe hypovolemia, severe hypotension, sympathetic stimulation with vasoconstriction of the hepatic arterial, administration of drugs like vasopressin and beta blockers, all those things decrease hepatic blood flow. But one of the biggest factors affecting hepatic blood flow is surgical manipulation in the right upper quadrant near the liver, which can dramatically reduce blood flow to the liver up to about 60%. This may be due to sympathetic stimulation or compression of vessels around the liver. Pneumoperitoneum that occurs during laparoscopy also reduces hepatic blood flow. And some of the things we do to uh, ventilation during anesthesia, such as switching from negative pressure to positive pressure ventilation, high peak airway pressures, high PEEP, hyperventilation with hypocarbia, those can all reduce liver blood flow. And very high uh, inhaled anesthetic agent uh, concentrations can reduce blood flow to the liver. Our volatile anesthetics uh, can decrease hepatic blood flow, isoflurane, desflurane, and sevoflurane. Uh, and there is a risk of liver injury from volatile anesthetics that in the past was termed halothane hepatitis, mostly a historical uh, halothane not being used anymore. Um, it was an immu immunologic mechanism of halothane induced liver injury. Postoperatively, you'd see massive increases in aminotransferase enzymes from the liver. 
Nowadays, with the modern inhaled anesthetics, isoforin, desforin, and sevoforin, uh, these are case reports pretty much only, very small number uh, of volatile anesthetics causing this, quote, halothane hepatitis. Sevoforin may have some benefits for a f uh, maintaining hepatic blood flow and having a low risk toxicity uh, profile in the liver. Nitrous oxide, yes, it does stimulate the sympathetic nervous system and potentially can decrease hepatic blood flow. It also inhibits some enzymes like methionine synthetase, but there's no convincing evidence of hepatotoxicity with nitrous oxide. Our non-opioid sedative hypnotics like ketamine and propofol and atominate and midazolam don't really have much significant effect on the liver blood flow. Opioids also little effect on hepatic function, but remember that opioids some of them need to be converted to their active form, codeine being example where the CYPD system converts codeine to morphine to make it an active analgesic agent. Also, opioids can increase the common bile duct and the sphincter of OD tone, causing uh, vaso, uh, or constriction of such. And years ago, when we would do uh, cholecystectomies and sometimes uh, do intraoperative cholangiograms. If a cholangiogram was done to look for, for example, a retained stone and you had opioids administered, you worried, okay, is the, uh, the cholangiogram uh, uh, substance in, uh, injected not getting through because of uh, constriction of the common bile duct because of my opioids or is there actually a stone embedded in there? And so we always worried about did our opioids, uh, should we be administering them in patients with uh, gallbladder surgery. Now, yes, they do increase the common bile duct and sphincter of OD tone. It can be reversed with multiple different drugs, including anticholinergics like atropine, glucagon, naloxone, but remember if you administer naloxone, you're also going to reverse the opioid analgesic effect, and nitroglycerin, but opioids aren't even absolutely contraindicated, even in patients with severe pancreatitis, so we don't worry too much about this uh, anymore. The liver has drug metabolic uh, properties and pathways, and if we look at the far right, you can see a drug going down one of two pathways. It can be oxidized in the cytochrome P450 system, often to a metabolite that is polar, water-soluble, and can be excreted in the liver. A drug can also go down another pathway, and for example, a sugar molecule, glucuronidation, uh, can be added to it. That molecule then can be excreted in the kidney, or uh, sometimes these uh, uh, drugs can be excreted in the biliary system into the gut. Phase one cytochrome P450 oxidative systems uh, work on many of our drugs, benzodiazepines. It can be induced by uh, drugs like alcohol and ketamine and barbiturates and benzodiazepines. Induction of the enzyme means it's ramped up and, uh, and can chew up other drugs more rapidly in patients that are chronically exposed to, for example, alcohol. Uh, phase one reactions are inhibited by cimetidine and HIV drugs. So if someone came in on an HIV drug and then was given, for example, midazolam, the midazolam may not be chewed up and the effect may be greater than it would be uh, if they were not receiving that HIV drug. Phase two reactions, conjugation or uh, putting a sugar molecule on it or a sulfate on it is what is referred to as a phase two reaction. Some drugs have a very high hepatic extraction ratio. That is, as that drug goes by the liver, a lot of it is removed and therefore metabolism is highly dependent upon how much blood flow is going to the liver. And two classic examples are lidocaine and morphine. If you administer a lidocaine infusion, for example, to a patient who has a low cardiac output, lidocaine levels may build up significantly in that patient. Some tests of uh, liver function, albumin and uh, PTINR are classic ones to assess the function of the liver itself rather than just whether there's been injury to the liver. PTINR is a very sensitive indicator because of the short half-life of factor seven for hepatic dysfunction while measuring uh, liver transaminases like ALT is a biomarker for hepatocellular injury, i.e. a breakdown or death of a liver cell and releasing the enzymes inside of it. So separate these two in your mind. Hepatic function is usually assessed with like albumin and PT, while hepatic uh, dysfunction and in injury, uh, specifically injury, is measured by release of transaminases. 
Looking at the graphic down below, you can see that if there's bilirubin overload, such as that occurs with hemolysis or resorption of a hematoma, bilirubin levels can go up unconjugated specifically. If there's parenchymal dysfunction of the liver, often we see the amino transferase is released from dying uh, liver cells. And in late stages of a poorly functioning liver, the prothrombin time can be prolonged. Cholestasis, we see increased uh, alkaline phosphatase levels. Remember that alkaline phosphatase can come from the biliary tract. It can come from bone. It can come from placenta and other places also. But if you have an elevated alk phos and an elevated, uh, elevated conjugated bilirubin, we often think of cholecystasis as the cause. We can also break down liver dysfunction into prehepatic, intrahepatic, and posthepatic. Often, like when we're thinking about renal dysfunction, break, breaking it down into prerenal, renal, and postrenal. So, prehepatic, a cause could be hemolysis, release of bilirubin. That bilirubin is measured in its unconjugated fraction. Um, and uh, uh, intrahepatic, we often think of amino transferase is going up from inside the liver cells themselves, ALT, AST, for example. And in late stages, albumin levels going down and prothrombin time going up. And a classic example of that would be hepatitis uh, and liver dysfunction associated with it. Posthepatic, often think of bilirubin in its conjugated form going up with elevations of alkaline phosphatase, and we look for stones in the bile duct. Some common liver pathophysiology associated with cirrhosis, portal hypertension. Hepatitis C and alcohol are the common etiology of such, and cardiovascular abnormalities are often associated. The classic physiologic changes that occur in a cirrhotic patient are vasodilation, low systemic vascular resistance, and the patient is very hyperdynamic. It's not uncommon to see cardiac outputs in the 10 to 15 liter range, SVRs in the 4 to 500 range mean arterial pressure uh, low, um, and these patients are hyporesponsive to vasopressors. You give phenylephrine and vasopressin and other drugs to try to constrict them, and they don't respond as well. And they often have arteriovenous collaterals or shunts such that the blood goes out through an artery instead of going to the tissues and the oxygen being used, goes through a shunt and right back into the venous system. And when we take a sample from our distal pulmonary artery catheter, in the main pulmonary artery, which is where a mixed venous oxygen is taken from, instead of having a saturation of maybe 70% or so, blood that's coming back with oxygen that hasn't been used from the tissues raises that level. And we have a mixed venous oxygen, sometimes in the high 80s and even 90%. And when you're doing a liver transplant patient, it's not uncommon to see that high cardiac output, vasodilated, low systemic vascular resistance, low blood pressure, and a high mixed venous oxygen saturation. In the lung, there can be vasodilation of blood vessels with shunt occurring. Intrapulmonary vasodilation can result in the hepatopulmonary syndrome in which that there is mild to moderate hypoxemia and oxygen desaturation because of it. And because it's a classic shunt, giving supplemental oxygen will not have a big change on oxygen levels in that patient. With liver failure, there is often coagulation issues. Vitamin K deficiency, uh, can be present uh, and remember that factor 2, 7, 9, and 10 are the vitamin K uh, def uh, dependent factors. There can be impaired synthesis of all the coagulation factors made by the liver remembering that factor 8 von Willebrand comes from the endothelium and not from the liver itself. The platelets are often low. The classic uh, cause of this is the spleen sequestering those platelets. And DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation, is not uncommon in patients with liver failure. A low-grade DIC, and normally the liver will clear fibrin degradation products. That is, if you have clot formation occurring, fibrinogen, and then fibrinogen being broken down into fibrin degradation products, usually those FDPs are cleared by the liver. If they build up, they can actually inhibit further platelet aggregation and normal cross-linking of fibrin monitors and result in coagulopathy. So multiple reasons to have a coagulopathy in patients with liver deficiency. Glucose and electrolytes can be affected. Specifically, we should worry about hypoglycemia in the perioperative period in a patient, for example, with cirrhosis. This can be due to failure of gluconeogenesis or making glucose uh, from other things like uh, amino acids 
uh, insufficient insulin degradation. If insulin is not being broken down, it's still present. It can make uh, sugar go into cells and result in hypoglycemia. And also depletion of the glycogen stores in the liver so that glycogenolysis or breakdown of glycogen to glucose, you don't have that glycogen to form glucose and the patient is at risk for hypoglycemia. Measure blood sugars in these cirrhotic patients. Watch carefully. You may have to give supplemental dextrose. Electrolyte alterations are not uncommon with hyponatremia, blood sugars, that is uh, sodiums in the 120 range and low uh, minerals such as phosphate, calcium, and magnesium. Anesthetic care, a couple things to focus in on. Think about rapid sequence induction in patients with liver failure. Ascites and gastric intestinal hypomobility can increase the risk of regurgitation with aspiration. If you're thinking of a regional anesthetic, you really need to look at your coagulation um, uh, measures. They may have low platelets, they may have a PT INR that's that prolonged, and coagulopathy may contraindicate a regional anesthetic. When you're thinking of correcting a coagulopathy in a patient with liver failure, fresh frozen plasma can be given to correct an INR to classically less than 1.5. Uh, Crow precipitate can be utilized if fibrinogen level is very low, for example, less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. Platelets, there's debate about when to give platelets, but often with the threshold of the 50 to 100,000 and in a patient who is oozing and or undergoing a surgery that is, puts them at high risk that if they bleed even a little bit, such as brain surgery, that it could be catastrophic, platelets would be administered. Vitamin K, often there's not a, a good response from the liver to produce 2, 7, 9, and 10 because the liver is so badly diseased. So given vitamin K to someone with severe liver disease, you may not get a great response in your PT INR uh, with correction. DDABP can be helpful in some patients because it releases factor 8 von Willebrand from endothelium and that is needed for platelets that you have in reduced number floating around to adhere to damaged collagen. Factor 7A, activated uh, factor 7 that is, uh, can be given occasionally, remembering that it's expensive and that you need adequate platelets, fibrinogen, and uh, temperature for it to work well in patients who, with liver failure who are bleeding. And in a patient, for example, who's post-operative, who they had liver injury and the liver starts to kick in and is working again, one of the best prognostic indicators is to look at your PT. And if your PT is improving without having to give blood products, uh, this may be an indicator that, um, that your liver is regaining some of its function. In the uh, perioperative uh, period, uh, the pharmacology of neuromuscular blocking agents, somewhat interesting, cisatricure, remember, is broken down spontaneously, independent of both hepatic and renal function, and may be ideal in these patients. Vecuronium and rocuronium have some hepatic metabolism with some prolongation of their effect. Oftentimes, we think of the initial dose of a non-depolarizing muscle relaxant needing to be increased because of these, for example, cirrhotic patient who has a large water space. If you give a water-soluble molecule, which neuromuscular blocking agents are, there's a large volume of distribution for it to go into and to get the same bang for your buck with your first dose it needs to be increased. Remembering then that, wow, all this drug is present in the body, the liver has to chew away at it many times, and there you have a prolong prolongation of effect. So increasing initial dose to get uh, the same speed of onset and effect if you wanted it, but also realizing that the duration is going to be prolonged. Now succinylcholine is not contraindicated in patients with liver failure, but remember that pseudocholinesterase is an enzyme and that proteins in the body most of them are made in the liver, pseudocholinesterase being one of those. If you don't have pseudocholinesterase around in its normal amounts, quantity that is, you may have slight prolonged duration of uh, apnea and neuromuscular blockade after succinylcholine administration. The postoperative period sometimes is associated with jaundice and it's not uncommon to have a surgeon say, hmm, maybe it's the volatile anesthetics that were administered in the perioperative period, remembering the historical halothane hepatitis that was immunologic mechanism of postoperative jaundice in patients who were exposed to halothane in the past.
This is extremely rare cause anymore. That is the volatile anesthetics. Surgical causes way more likely, especially if the operation involved the liver or the biliary tract. If a patient had multiple blood transfusions, they could uh, have hemolysis, delayed hemolysis, uh, and uh, uh, bilirubin levels going up, and uh, possibly resorption of large hematomas. They may have had underlying liver disease prior to surgery. Uh, and uh, exposure to drugs uh, or have infections that are causing this postoperative jaundice. And that should be considered rather than the volatile anesthetics as the cause. So let's recap our American Board of Anesthesia in training exam keywords on hepatic physiology, realizing that liver transplant uh, is not covered in this podcast, but will be covered in later video casts. Under liver physiology specifically, we have hepatic blood flow, realizing that the portal vein and the hepatic artery supply blood flow to the liver, with the portal vein supplying most of the blood flow and equal oxygen levels, uh, oxygen supply being supplied by both the hepatic artery and the hepatic vein. The buffer system being when the hepatic uh, portal vein blood flow goes up, the hepatic arterial blood flow goes down, and it's the hepatic artery that is responding. Um, in during starvation, the liver can take glycogen if it has some in it and, uh, and produce glucose. It can take fats and produce sugar. Uh, hepatic dysfunction can be diagnosed by many different types of lab tests. Hepatic function itself, synthetic capacity, we usually measure things like PT and albumin, while a, uh, aminotransferases are usually used as a reflection of liver injury or release of these enzymes from damaged hepatic cells. Hepatic bilirubin, uh, uh, the body can make a large amount of uh, fat absorbing um, uh, bile and that bile goes down the bile duct into the intestine, uh, makes the, that fat so that it can be absorbed and in patients that don't have uh, bilirubin because of obstruction for example fat soluble vitamins and uh, vitamin K being one of those may not be absorbed coagulopathy may ensue with cirrhosis neuromuscular blocking pharmacokinetics are changed remembering cisatricurium has spontaneous breakdown and has some ideal characteristics in patients such as this succinylcholine not contraindicated but pseudocholinesterase levels may be decreased the hepatopulmonary syndrome referred to the vasodilation of blood vessels in the lung with uh, bypassing of blood past alveolar units, classic shunt in the lung, um, and uh, this shunt and low oxygen levels would not be very responsive to supplemental oxygen. Postoperative jaundice, not usually volatile anesthetics. In fact, that would be extremely rare at the cause often being surgical damage to the liver or bile tract biliary tract, or possibly think of reabsorption of hematoma, uh, hemolysis of blood, infectious etiology, drug etiologies, rather than our volatile anesthetics. This ends our discussion on liver physiology. I hope you have a great day. This is a picture of me hiking in the Kentucky Red River Gorge in a beautiful spring day. Have a great day.